Okay, so uh, regarding this discussion, uh, actually we are talking about some of the papers, like right? recent advances or the articles which are like fact now. Okay, so again the same issue. One minute. I'll stop the video because the thing is, I will close it over here so that I can talk. Okay, so David Sackett said that half of what you learn at medical school will be either dead wrong or out of date within five years. So, and the trouble is that nobody can tell you which half. So research is going on so quickly that within the last five years you will you will not be able, the, the facts which, were, which you studied will, will, will be not facts later on. Satish, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. You, you saw calcaneus fracture anywhere in your training? Calcaneum yes, sir. Fracture. What type of injury yes. caused calcaneum fracture? Sir, so these injuries are uh, basically caused due to axial loading. Yes, good. Okay, so high energy axial loading injuries. And do you know what is the classification for it? Okay. Uh, uh, I remember sir, SX uh, leprosy classification. Yes. There is another classification of CT also. Uh, standards, standards. Standards. Yes, okay. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you when you operate for the calcaneus, there are some principles when you operate for the calcaneus, okay? I will tell you the principles. The four indications are, one is loss of height, second is varus, third is subtalar subluxation or dislocation, and fourth is subfibular impingement, okay? Uh, you are listening to me? Okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so these are the four indications, loss of height, varus, Subtalar subluxation or dislocation or subfibular impingement. Okay, so sands are classified into four types one, two, three, four. One is undisplaced, two, three, four are that, then they are the fracture lines according to the uh, at, at the facet region on the, on the coronal CT. Okay, so what approach you do for CT scan uh, for the calcaneum ORIF? Anyone can tell me? Lateral or medial? Lateral, lateral, lateral L shape, sir. Yes, lateral. Why you do lateral is it access the sub, sub tailor and clavicular joint, okay? And yes, it sir. helps him to do in plating. So, Sander. Sander is a scientist name. If you remember him, he, the author noted the distinct learning curve with improved clinical results of type 2 and type 3 fractures in later years of surgical experience. Then he quoted, although anatomical articular reduction is necessary, for a good result, it does not guarantee good results. Okay, and he recommended for type four fractures, primary arthrodesis. Okay, this is the same Sanders. Buckley in nineteen in two thousand two, he said the best patient to treat non-operative were more than fifty years old male, those receiving worker compensation and those whose occupation involved heavy working, low work loading. Okay. Then Fall Kital, 2002 again, this is regarding wound complication. He's thinking mm -hmm. that the smoking, diabetes mellitus, and open fracture increase the risk of wound complications after calcaneal ORIF. So this is that, you know, you can see the p-values, diabetes, smoking, and open fractures. This have increased risk of getting open complication wound injuries, okay, after the surgery. Then is this is, you can do percutaneous fixation of calcaneus. And they found the wall in 2010 quoted that there is no difference in need for hardware removal. So the fact is that you don't need to remove the hardware. So percutaneous fixation is almost equivalent enough. And he said that healing time for a calcaneus is four months. Okay. And there are low risk of wound infection in the percutaneous fixation if you can do percutaneous. Uh, you can hear me, huh? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. So this is 2011 Pontenza, 2011. This is the last article which shows that primary subtalar arthrodesis for Martley community standard type 4 calcaneus fracture yields good midterm results. So 
For type 4 standards, in exam settings, you can say that I can do primary orthodosis. This is a, another, uh, these are review articles if you can want to read them. This is a very good, um, uh, at least the first one, it has a very good explanation of why calcaneus tuberosity fractures occur and how, you, how to treat them. Who will tell me what is the sign on this arrow? This is a Liz Frank injury. No, but this sign is. What is this sign called? Sign. I have put an arrow. So there is some sign yes, in sir. it. Who knows the sign? Can somebody tell me? It's okay. It's okay. No problem. Sometimes you people, you, no one remembers it. So what do you think? What is this sign called? This white sort of a... Spike? No, this is very important in exam. It's called flex sign. Flex sign. Yes, flex sign. Yeah, so remember the flex sign. Sign. Do you know any other findings? What is this, by the way? Les Frank. Uh, Les Frank. Huh? Les Frank injury. Les Frank ligament is between which bones? So the second metatarsal and uh, medial new, Good. Medial Excellent. Okay. So there are two Les Frank ligament. One is plantar and one is dorsal. Which one is strongest? Plantar is stronger. Plantar is Plantar. Okay. So, do you know what are the other radiographic markers for this front? Okay, I will tell you. One is flex sign, one. Second is this, that the line joining from the lateral aspect of the first metatarsal should cross the, me, the medial aspect of the middle cuneiform. Okay. This, the, 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 the third sign is that from the medial, uh, from the lateral, medial aspect of the fifth metatarsal, if you draw a line, it should cross the cuboid. So it is displaced laterally. Sir, can you explain the flex sign, sir? Flex sign, if you see this arrow, this is the yes, evolution sir. injury of the medial mm -hmm. cuneiform. Okay? Yes, sir. The bone yes. piece. And you, it's visible. This is called flex sign. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about Jones fracture? Do you know what is Jones fracture? Yes, sir. Yes, it's sir. Uh, fifth, fifth metatarsal stress fracture. No? Evolution, evolution fracture, fifth metatarsal. Yes. 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 Like you say, I do time like Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can you listen me to me? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. I have removed one person. Actually, the Jones fracture are classified. The fracture of the fifth metatarsal are classified into three types. Okay. One, two, and three. One is called evolution injury. That is evolution of which muscle? Any idea? Uh, bravis. 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 Longest is attached to the first metatarsal. Yes. Okay. Two is metaphysio-diaphysial injury <laughs> called Jones injury. Okay. Metaphysio-diaphysial <laughs> fracture of the metatarsal is called Jones fracture. Okay. Distal to the base. Yes, metaphysio diaphysial yes. is Jones. Three is diaphysial injury, which is caused by stress fracture. You get me? Right. Okay. So, should we have a problem with the changing the screen? Okay. So, Mologni et al., this is 2009, he said that early uh, intramedullary screw fixation is safe and effective, resulting in short time of union and faster return to activity. So, in patients who are sport related, Jones fracture should be fixed. It's better. They will, uh, they will, come, they will go early for the, their sports activity. So, this is Koetze et al., he said that primary arthrodesis of medial two or three rays result in better short and medium term outcome compared to the traditional ORF. We are talking about the Les Frank injury. How you fix Les Frank, by the way? Any idea? Sir, by securing the uh, second metatarsal with the medial cuneiform. Yes. And also, sir, uh, a second, sir, a screw fixation or plate fixation from the first 
a metatarsal to the cuboid. Excellent. And what about the lateral ring? Uh, you put a KY. Sir. You, can, you do yeah, KY. KY. You can KY. do KY. Why you do KY? Uh, actually, these things are not in book. These are simple facts. It's actually, as a because the there's too much space. Less space for the implants. No, 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 no. You can do fixation. The problem is that there is more movement in the lateral three rays. Okay, so walking will be hampered if you lateral three rays are fixed with screws. So normally it needs Very something true. like uh, 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 so KY fixation is better than putting a screw or a plate on lateral aspect. We avoid it. Okay. Right. So these are the articles you can read it. It's uh, these are simple articles, but some of them are you know the fracture and dislocation of the four foot this uh, Schenck et al. 1995. It has very beautifully explained all the complications which can come in operative and non-operative fractures. Okay, what is this fracture? Tell us. Sir, this is the uh, tell us neck fracture, sir. Mm. How you classify it? So by Hawkins classification. Uh, Hawkins yes. classification, father, sir. How yeah, you in Taiwan, my... there is a in Taiwan there is undisplaced fracture of neck and type two fracture neck talus fracture with a subtalar dislocation, yeah, subluxation, and type three there is a neck talus neck fracture with a ankle dislocation or subluxation, yes, and in type four both subluxation. No type four with talus navicular, talus navicular. Type four okay. theory never could also. That's the thing. Okay, sir. So which which one has what is Hawkins sign then? Hawkins sign. Sir, it Hawkins is uh, zone of sclerosis in within the uh, neck of the talus. Mm -hmm. uh, it should represents the uh, uh, subcondyl scleroling, sir. The viability of the tail neck or talus. Yeah, but, but it's not sclerosis. It's lucency. Check the book. It's lucency. Sorry. Yes, sir. It's lucency. lucency. Sclerosis means that the AVN is, is, is going to happen. AVN is present, yes, sir. Mm, no, not present. Can happen. It's not a surety. If Hawking sign is negative, this if not present, this means that there is risk of AVN. This does not mean AVN has happened. Still, right. there is an article for it also that if there is if Hawking sign is not a must, but Hawkins give you a satisfaction that yes, this is alive, the bone is alive. Lucency occurs when the fracture is fixed and there is blood supply. The sign of revascularization. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So this is the article 1970, Taylor neck lucency. So Hawken explained that to assess the Taylor vascularity between six to eight weeks, you should do a radiograph, non-weight bearing, and it should show disuse atrophy. And this absence of uh, subsequent atrophy at uh, this uh, lucency means that there is uh, there is still blood supply, and subchondral atrophy excludes the diagnosis of AVN because bone must be vascularized in order to undergo disuse osteoporosis resorption. Sorry. So this he um, what what should I what the what word should I use that he 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 was the one who gave the name Hawkins sign. Okay, 1970. So this is Valiar et al. He showed that uh, overall AVN rate was 49% in all tailless fractures. He showed that in type 2 fracture, AVN rate is 39%. Type 3 fracture, AVN rate is 64%. And type 4, interestingly, has rate of AVN of 20%. This is different from the book, by the way. So AVN was associated with tailor neck Comminution and open fracture. Okay, he said that urgent reduction or dislocation is important and treatment of open injuries, but delaying definite rigid fixation until and unless soft tissue swelling has subsided in order to minimize soft tissue complications. This is different. Before 2000, they were fixing everything. Telus comes, it's emergency, just fix it. He said no, reduce the dislocation and wait till the swelling in the subcutaneous tissue and the skin compromise is resolved and then fix it. So nowadays we do what Valier 
found in 2004 in his article. We reduce the talus and we do operative intervention if the soft tissue swelling, there is no soft tissue swelling, we go for surgery. Otherwise, we delay definitive reconstitution. Who will tell me what is this? This is pilon, it's written over it. So what is the principle of pilon fracture fixation? Whenever you fix any fracture, there should be a principle to fix it. Sir, ideally there should be anatomical reduction. Sir. Okay, one, two. Stable fixation. Okay, let's take this also. And preservation of the blood supply. Restoration of, of the articular surface. Absolute, absolute reduction. Okay. Now you are going haphazard. There are four, four principles. AO principles are four in this. Yes. First is anatomical reduction. Maintain the length. No, maintain the length. How you maintain so, the length? You yeah. fix the fibula. Fibula. Okay. Second, you fix the fracture. The tibia fracture, which is the main fracture, you fix it. Third, bone grafting. Metaphysical communication should be either not opened or you do bone graft in it. And fourth, intra-articular reduction. Perfect intra-articular reduction should be achieved. These are the four principles. Okay, remember this because they will ask you an exam. These things they will always ask you what are the principles for fixation of this fracture. So if you tell him you fix the fibula, he will tell you for what. So you have to tell him that fixation of fibula because I want to maintain the length. Second is intraarticular congruity right. to be maintained. Third, fixation of the fracture, the metaphysical communication, I need to fix it some way. Fourth, bone grafting. Right. So this is a classic paper of Rudial Gore, 1969. And this is where he uh, explained that this, these things should be done. So the author concluded that high energy, high percentage of good functional results supporting achieving optimal endromic reduction. Uh, the critic was that most of his patients were low energy patients, had low energy. These are the complications which he showed up. But he said that... Uh, he wrote here that 90% were able to return to the same occupation, which is now refuted already by new articles. Most of the patients don't do well. This is, this is the article of Serkin. This is article which showed stage protocol for soft tissue management in the treatment of complex pylon fracture 1999. Since then, these four principles have been like part of fixation, part of the plan of management of, of uh, pylon fractures. Look at this. He said the protocol consists of immediate 24, within 24 hours, ORI of fibula and application of spanning external fixator. Later on, ORI of tibia after a lag of 7 4 to 14 days. Average time for external fixator, 14 days. Two cases 14. developed partial thickness wound necrosis. Both were treated successfully with local wound care. One case developed wound dehiscence. One case with epsilateral contained calcaneal fracture developed severe osteomyelitis. The result compared favorably with the op, with the Excuse reporting. Me, yes. Uh, Dr. Ali is uh, asking, requesting to join again. I cannot join. I cannot join. He was talking, so I cannot join. Please, I cannot oh, join him. Okay. He, uh, even if I try, I cannot join him. Uh, tell him I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The author concluded that the high rate of complication associated with tibial pylon ORIF was due to early operative treatment through swollen compromised soft tissues. The stage protocol present in this paper and commonly used today until now significantly decreased the complication rate associated with tibial pylon fracture. So whenever in exam, you can quote this paper and even up till now, like last 20 years, we have been doing the same for pylon fractures unless he comes on the same date. Like he, the patient, after the pylon fracture, directly come to you and you are going for the OR within four hours and you keep him and the patient is NPO also. So you can do different fixation, no problem. But otherwise, most of them are staged. This is another 1996 prospective study and the investigator concluded that external fixation is a satisfactory method for tibial pylon fracture and is used with fewer complication rate than ORIF. This is the only article, 2010, 
which shows non-state pylon ORF. Only one article in the whole last 20 years, only one article is saying that non-state should be done directly operating. In atomic reduction, 90% cases is possible. The investigators concluded that when surgery is performed expeditiously by experienced trauma surgeon, most tibial pylon fractures can be treated with primary ORF. Most have educated state surgery except this study. I, I, I wrote it down because you should remember it. This is Wang et al. Comparison of two-stage ORIF with limited internal fixation with external fixator for closed tibial plafond fractures. Limited internal fixation with external fixator is rated with higher rate of superficial infections. Primary pain track infection, but this does not affect the final outcome. He's saying that external fixator will cause pain track infections and these things, but end resultant, the patient will still, this will not affect his outcome. This is Polak in 2003. He said high energy TPL pyramid fracture outcomes. He, regarding this, he discussed that investigators conclude that the patients sustaining TPL pyramid fractures suffer persistent and devastating consequences of his general health and well being. And they do, 68% will not work the same job. And this is like nowadays, most of people agree that pyramid fractures, the patient will not come back to the same level. It's not possible. These are review articles. I have not read all of them, but you can have a look in, into it. Actually, here I'm talking about syndesmosis. How many fix screw you will fix with syndesmosis? Anyone has an idea? One, two, or three? Two, uh, single, two, single, two, single, two, two. One cortex. Two, How many cortex? So three cortexes. Three cortexes. Three cortexes sir. Why not four? Uh, Why not four? Because uh, the, uh, when there is a, a dorsiflexion of the ankle, it will mm -hmm. cut through. Okay. Who is this, by the way? Who is talking to me? Uh, I am Dr. Abed from uh, Dr. Abed. Lahore. Dr. Abed, yes. In your exam, you will tell that dorsiflexion will, will do... Uh, actually, when you dorsiflex the foot, the tip, the talus is, is, is broader on, on dorsiflexion. Anteriorly, it's, do, it, it's, it's broader. So what they say is when you dorsiflex, it can cut out. But actually, this has been refuted already. Since last two, three years, they say that dorsiflexion does not cause anything. Mm -hmm. But I will, uh, it does not cause any problem. But the thing is, on the exam, you can tell him. He will be happy. But still, uh, this is 1976 Ramsey. And this will be asking questions. Uh, he... This, this paper is that changes in tibiotalar area of contact caused by lateral tailor shift, 1976. And this has been tested. 42% average decrease in contact area with a 1 mm of lateral tailor shift. This came in my MCQs also. So 42% decrease in contact area with 1 mm of lateral tailor shift. When the when, when the contact areas decrease, the load per unit area is increased. So there are more chances the patient will go into osteoarthritis. Because stress per unit area increases as the total contact area decreases, the decrease in tibiotalar contact area may contribute to poor outcomes following ankle fractures when later tailor displacement is more than 1 mm. So you it anatomically. This is Will Roy et al. 2000. No difference in functional and radiographic results 8.4 years after quad quadricortical compared to tricortical syndesmosis fixation in ankle fractures. 8.4 years, by the way, it's enough that he has said that there is no difference in tricortical or quadricortical. Okay. No tricortical and quadricortical syndesmotic fixation shows satisfactory functional results. Obese patients have significantly poor results. Uh, difference in syndesmotic width of 1.5 mm or greater than two ankles seem to be associated with inferior clinical results. So again, there is Hoyness 2007, tricortical versus quadricortical syndesmotic fixation ankle fracture with syndesmosis. At three months, pain was significantly lower in tricortical group. So he is supporting you. Hoyness 2007 is supporting you that within three months, tricortical works well. But at one year, there is no significant difference in the pain between the two groups. No significant difference in dorsiflexion between the group at any time point, as I told you previously. So, 
if I, you did a fixation of ankle, what you will do? You will do a cast or a brace? <coughs> Uh, uh, we'll do a cast. Is it important to cast? Back flexion. For uh, fibula fixation, sir, is it's not a stable fixation? Yeah, it, it can be stable. Why not? But still, you will do cast or back slap. Uh, cast or uh, sorry, ankle brace. Okay. This is the answer over here. You are right. Backslide is better. Just you, I will show you the answer. This is Latin in 2003. Cast compared with functional ankle brace after operative treatment of ankle fracture. No perioperative complication in either group. So it does not matter. But he said significantly most post-op complication in the functional brace group and common complication was infection. Superficial and then deep. So there are we cannot explain why infection is more in 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 a brace. I am not sure why, but yes, you can put a back slap and you can support it by this. These are another review articles which you can, if you want to read. So, one second. So this is tibia. We will talk about some articles. Yes, sir. Okay. This is top cited paper uh, by Bone LB, 1994. His prospective study of union rate of open tibial fractures treated with locked and unreamed intramedullary nerves. So he quoted that average time of union is 148 days. So probably five months. Author concluded that unreamed nailing did not improve union rates compared to the historical rate of external fixation. Actually, this article is discussing the open fractures, tibia, comparing the reamed, uh, unreamed nail with external fixator at that time, 1994. And he quoted that does not matter, external fixator or unreamed nail does not improve the union rates. So if you put it into external fixator, it does not matter. It has the same results. What is this? This is PT PTB. Okay. Do you know, do you know yeah, but he do you know who, who devised this concept? PTB cast? Sarmento. 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 So Sarmento 2004. He he this is a like 450 close fractures of distal third tibia treated with functional brace. And he found that 90% of the patient healed with less than 8 degree of angular deformity in either front or sagittal plane. He also put that final shortening was essentially unchanged from initial shortening at the time of injury. So the amount of shortening you have after the patient had a fracture, the same, it will be, remain the same. So conclusion of functional braces for treatment of closed tibial distal third fracture is a viable approach that offers satisfactory clinical radiographic results in high percentage of instances. This is Bandari. By the way, I want to tell you something. If you have not read articles, this guy is amazing. This guy, Bandari, most of his paper are top cited. He is a very renowned like, uh, research personality. So, regarding predictors of reoperation following operative management of fracture of tibial shaft. So, why you reoperate a patient with tibial shaft fractures? Three variables, he said. First, presence of open fracture. Third, second, lack of cortical continuity. Third, presence of a transverse fracture. So these are the factors, prognostic variables, which can assist the surgeon in predicting reoperation following operative treatment of tibial shaft fractures. For example, if you have a patient which has a transverse fracture, it is more riskier than a spiral or oblique fracture. Lack of cortical continuity, it increases the risk of reoperation. In the presence of open fracture, there are more chances that it should have more intervention. Uh, it will need another intervention. So surgeons should avoid distraction at the fracture site. The one variable that is under surgeon's control, whenever possible, the treatment of tibial shaft fractures. This is Veliar in 2011 compared plate versus IM kneeling for distal tibia shaft fractures. 
So he quoted that both un non locked plating and dreamed I am nearly have higher primary union rates in distal tibial shaft fractures. The rate of infection, non union, and secondary procedure are similar. Uh, but he quoted fibula fixation may be facilitate better reduction of TBI at the time of surgery, but further studies warranted. If you note this over here, I, I am kneeling was fit with more mal alignment. If I put a nail for a tibia fracture, how the bone will heal? Primary or secondary? Second intention. Secondary, sir. Why? There is a sir, dynamic relative stability. Sir. It's a relative, relative stable. What about plate? There is an absolute, absolute length. It's absolute stable in plant and there is no callus formation. What is this? Who knows it? Knee dislocation. Knee joint. Mm. Which side? What do you think? It's the posterior medial or posterior lateral? Posterior medial. Needs another view. Needs another view. Posterior medial. Posterior medial. Posterior medial. No, sir. Uh, in uh, knee, uh, dislocation is defined uh, with the translation of the uh, uh, tibia, not the tibia. femora. So tibia. So what is this? Just see. It's a posterior medial tibia. So it's posterior it's medial. Posterior medial. For the posterior, we have to take the we have to look for the another view. Looks like nah, posterior. Yes. <laughs> it's a posterior yeah. medial. Don't complicate yourself. What is this posterior medial? Oh, medial or lateral? Just leave it. Medi medial, 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 medial. So medial. It is posterior medial, by the way. How you classify yes, it, by the way? The Schenck classification. You know what the. Uh, one is either ACL or PCL is intact. Okay. Yes, yes, two yes. is as both torn up. You can remember it like two type two ACL PCL torn. Yes. Okay. Three is a ACL PCL plus posterior medial corner or posterior lateral corner. Okay. Four okay. is four torn ACL PCL posterior medial corner posterior lateral corner. Five is frank dislocation. Shank classification. Mm. So how, uh, if you have a fracture dislocation, uh, sorry, you have a dislocation, knee dislocation in the ER, how will you reduce it? What you will do, first step? First of all, we will go for reduction. You will not examine the patient? No, Sir, ATLS. 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 Okay, and then it will like go for the this is ne ne uh, neurovascular status of the patient. Okay, okay, uh, no pulsation now. No, sir, uh, if there is no pulsation, I will go for the reduction first. Okay, then analgesia, I sedation, the analgesia, and sedate him. Yes, okay, okay, uh, yes. except both, both of them are right. So you reduce it, and then you do selective angiography, you don't do. Every patient is not for angioplasty, angiography suit. The patient, which is after the reduction, still there is vascular deficit and ankle brachial index is less than 0.9, then you go for angiography. Otherwise, you proceed for reduction of dislocation. First. So, Kennedy, this is, I'm not sure about the year because I missed it, I think so. It's complete dislocation of the knee, order of structure injury in the anterior dislocation, which is more common. First, he said that the posterior capsule injury occurs at the average 30 degree of hyperextension. Then PCL tear up, then popliteal artery, okay, and popliteal artery rupture occurred in the average of 50 degree of hyperextension. Okay, posterior dislocation are harder to create and require greater torques. This is cadaveric study probably. And associated vascular or nerve injuries occur in more than 50% of the patients. Early vascular exploration is mandatory when there is suspicion of vascular injury. 
simple treatment of uncomplicated cases may produce surprisingly good results. And he advocated early repair of major ligaments result in a useful knee. This is Twedel et al. 2003, 63 cases of complete dislocation. He said frequency of ligamentous injury, 84% ACL, 87% ECL, 71% ACL and ECL, 44% MCL and 62% LCL. So most common injury is ACL and PCL. This is Stenad, and uh, this was a, this is the study which shifted our uh, plan of management. Previously, most of the patients used to go for uh, angiography suits. So Stenad 2004, he, this study was the shift from arteriogram to physical examination. He quoted that vascular injuries in knee dislocation, the role of physical examination determining the need for arteriography. So he quoted that indication of art arteriography is decreased pedal pulse, lower activity color or temperature change, expanding hematoma above the knee, and history of abnormal physical examination prior to presentation. Conclusion, his conclusions were selective angiography based on serial physical examination is a safe and prudent policy following knee dislocation. There is a strong correlation between knee physical examination results and need for arteriography. Increased vigilance may be justified in patients with KD4, dislocation state with tear of both PCL and postulatory and postmedial corner, for whom serial examination should continue for at least 48 hours. Who will tell me why 48 hours? Because uh, intimal tears uh, yes. mostly. Very good, very good. Intimal tears. Most of them are intimal tears. So you have to admit them and keep him admitted for 48 hours to assess if there is any uh, uh, deterioration. So most of them are not complete tears, they are intimal tears and it can progress. That's why you have to admit the patient and for two days. This is the, I took it from Campbell, uh, sorry, Miller. And if you see the apparent knee dislocation, you have to physically examine. If it's absent, pedal pulsation absent, reduce the dislocation first, and then reassess the pulsations. So, if this patient comes with a polytrauma, what you will do? To fix it. Fix, but what to fix? Like how to fix? Polytrauma. He had a fractured tibia, Sir, uh, fractured femur, bilateral fractured humerus, yeah. and clavicle fracture also. Tell me what you will fix. And how are you will fix? And any idea? So first of all, according so to the ADL protocol, ADL is done vitally stable. Vital blood pressure is um, 100 by 70. Okay. Secondary assessment showed mm -hmm. urine output of like 28 ml per hour per hour so now what you do we can go with an external fixator for the femur or an unreeb nail how will you decide scientifically how will you decide this is a good question how, how uh, scientifically? Uh, you will examine the patient I told you output. Output is okay. For example, 28 ml. 28 ml per, yes. uh, per an hour. The kidney is okay. Okay, the kidneys are okay. What else you want to know? Status uh, of the lungs? Okay. I did the I chest x The chest is normal. Then? Sir, uh, I will go for the D timer. To check for the pulmonary embolism, in, you are suspecting in, pulmonary embolism in, negative. D dimer is positive, but the doctor the is negative. Let's take it negative. Age, <coughs> what about age and condition? Have you heard about lactate base deficit, transportation oxygen measurement? These things, hmm. you remember, you have heard about these things, yes. Yes, okay, yes, yes. yes. So that, that's what I was telling that you, you won't practice, we don't practice. So we don't know. So you do ABGs. So if fear of lactate is uh, less than two, so how will you fix it? You will definitely, you can do definitive fixation in this patient if less than two, okay? If the, okay. If the, if, if the 
if the uh, uh, the 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 serum lactate is two to two point five, you do damage control surgery. Okay. okay. And if lactate is more than two point five, what you will do? You will shift the patient back to ICU. You are not operating on this patient. Okay. 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 So right, right, so less than two, I will do definitive fixation. 2 to 2.5, I will do damage control surgery. More than 2.5, I will shift the patient to ICU. This patient is not stable enough for a while. Okay. So, this is bone LB. This is a randomized controlled trial, landmark studies, 1996. He compared early versus delayed stabilization of femoral fractures. So, he quoted early stabilization decreases pulmonary complications. Okay. So, he, it reduces the risk of ARDS, pulmonary dysfunctions, fat embolism, abnormal ABGs, pulmonary embolism. And so, he quoted that any polytrauma patient, early stabilization is, is, is better than delaying it. Before this study, we were putting external traction pins for every patient. Are you getting me? We were not fixing it. We were putting external skeletal traction and okay, admit the patient and let it be for one week. Because the thing is, if we operate on them now, they will die. So he quoted that no, you should fix the fractures because of decreasing the risk. If it is not a polytrauma, it's a single isolated fracture femur, you better fix it as early as possible within 24 to 48 hours. So the author provided the overwhelming recommendation that early stabilization of long bone fractures should be performed in multiple injury patients. When early stabilization of long bone fracture is done in conjunction with early intubation, ventilatory support, and proper management of fluids, the, late, the rate of pulmonary failure in these patients is distractly, drastically reduced and will lead to dramatic savings. Prior to this study, patients were treated with traction, often leading to deterioration of their condition and even death. While trials are, randomized trials were, are now common, this was rare in orthopedic study in, at that time. This was a landmark study because the RCT trials are the best trials. So this was the, I think the, the very like the, the, the very beginning of RCT trials in orthopedic. Previously that it was not common. This is Nowatarski in 2000. He said conversion. Of, okay, I want to ask you something. Femur fracture, I put excellent fixator. When you will nail it? When you change into nail? After uh, three weeks, sir. Why three weeks? Why not two weeks? Yes. No. Within two weeks. Sir, when okay. they test, checking, tissue coverage, after, after checking the contact infection, lactates. After soft tissue, uh, when the soft tissue coverage is proper, sir, and is covering the both, then we will do. It. Okay, that, that's okay. That's okay. That's your protocol. You remove the external fixator and put a skeletal traction and shift the patient to the home. And let him come when the wound is healed and we will put a nail. That is your protocol. But I want to change the IM nail, remove the pin in the OR and put a nail directly. I want to remove the shan pin and put a nail in directly. So this can be done within two weeks. That's it. After that, there are more chances of infection. So this is the guy, Novotarsky, 2000. He showed that conversion of external fixator to IM nailing of fracture shaft of femur in multiple injury patients. He said average time in x fix prior to nailing was 10 days and 95, 97% healed with six, within six months. And he, he quoted that while it remains unknown how long external fixation can be safe before there is increase of infection risk. But in his study, he did conversion within two weeks and the results were excellent. So he said within two weeks you can convert it. So you put external fixator, within 10 days the patient is fine now the serum lactate based deficit, everything is okay. So you shift him to the OR, remove the shunt pin, and directly put a nail in. It will not cause infections. This is BOSS 1997, adult respiratory distress uh, syndrome, pneumonia, and mortality following thoracic injury and the femoral fracture treated either with IM nailing, with reaming, or with plating. A comparative study. So he's quoted that IM nailing with reaming for acute stabilization of femur in polytrauma, thoracic injury does not increase the occurrence of ARDS, pulmonary embolism, 
failure of multiple organs, pneumonia or death. Before this, we were doing unrim nails in to avoid ERDS. Okay. So after this study, the, the guy quoted that you can read the patient uh, nail, you can put a ream nail and do not cause ARDS unless you take care of the other markers like the base deficit, urine output, vitals, and these things. So it will not cause second hit. These are some review articles. Uh, what is this? Who will tell me? What is this? <laughs> This is tip to apex station tip apex. while doing uh, how much it should be less than 25 mm Sir, it should be 0.5 to 1 centimeter don't say this the centimeters just say 25 mm less than 25 mm so in if both a piece, view, huh? in both AP and lateral in both yes. views uh, AP and lateral yeah. view yeah but how much it should be less than 25 mm Yes. yes. Uh, this was shown by Baumgartner in 1997. He said the value of tip apex index is predicting failure of fixation of peritrochanteric fracture of hip. Average TAD in cases with screw cutout was 33 mm. Average TAD in case without screw cutout was 24 mm. So he said that below 25 mm, you should aim for this. So he, this guy also quoted some factors. He quoted the chances of failure of the reduction or implant. And he said that if tape apex index is more than 30 mm, it will fail. If there is an unstable fracture, it will fail. If the age is more than 76, it will fail. Or plate angle is more than 150, it can fail. So, how will you fix, uh, who will tell me, I have a patient of 80 years old, okay, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, walking without any stick, had a neck or femur fracture, what will I do? Uh, uh, Can I just for total hip orthoplasty, prime view total hip orthoplasty. Total hip orthoplasty, uh, okay. Duration. Duration of sir. injury. What? I would like the logical age, sir. Fix that fracture. Can not reduce. You, 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 you can reduce. Uh, eight years old female will not survive if there is a displaced neck or fever fracture. It will not be. <clears throat> it is of no use. For example, I will ask you another question now. It's an eight years old female with a fractured neck or femur displaced. Previous history when I asked, she was walking with a stick. Now what you will do? Hemiarthroplasty. Why? Using hemiartotal arthroplasty. This is not answer. Or total hepat. This is not answer. In your exam, this is not answer. In your exam, it will be hemiarthroplasty. Why? Actually, in the clinic scenarios, you can assess and pay patient and decide to go for total hip or hemiarthroplasty. But for eight years, we walking with a stick. This means that she ha is, has already weakness. She, she's already yes, yeah, and yeah. The she has already abductor weakness. Okay? So mm -hmm. it's more chances to give a hemiarthroplasty for a patient with abductor weakness. And for example, the same patient is without a stick, walking ambulatory, normal community ambulance, eight years old, I will go for total hip replacement. Okay, for the same patient, if the patient has a Schlammer disease, then what you will do? A Schleimer disease. Yes. Al Alzheimer's. Uh, we can go for. Uh, I mean, autoplasty. More chances that the he fixation, will. Fixation, the osteosynthesis. Can you say? No, you cannot. I will go for the. Eight years old. Let's take autoplasty, though. Or, or we can go for. The, uh, section autoplasty. Is the patient is it mobile it's or not? Okay. Mobile. okay. One minute, one minute, one minute. In your exam, never say the section autoplasty. Never seen. Mm. Yeah. In exam, eight years old female at Schleimer, the patient will more go for hemiarthroplasty than total hip replacement. More towards hemiarthroplasty. What about arthrodesis? No, I don't think arthrodesis will be there. Arth your arthrodesis for a young patient who is a laborer. That's it. Done. 
Just it. Right, right. Don't don't mm -hmm. don't decide on the Martha. He will ask you why you want to work the reason. You will tell them that this will give you buy time. So that again, you totally yeah. replacement. The patient will, uh, the doctor will ask you, like he, the patient is 80 years old. You want her to be crossing 100 for total replacement. So if any patient with displaced yeah. neck or fracture above 60, you can go for total hip replacement depending on the patient's general condition. If the patient is walking with a stick, having a Schleimer disease, or the patient is having neuromuscular disease or something else, I will go for hemiarthroplasty. Otherwise, the patient's community ambulance above 60, neck or fever, displaced, the recommendation is to go for total hip replacement. So this is the patient, this I told you, this guy, Bandari, 2008, neck or fever fracture in elderly. Internal fixation compared with arthroplasty for displaced fracture of femoral neck. He quoted that mortality rates in 1162 patients provide detailed information on mortality rates during the first four post-op months. Mortality rate was 0 to 20%. There was a trend towards an increase in the relative risk in the first four months after arthroplasty compared to internal fixation. Treatment of displaced femur neck fractures by arthroplasty significantly reduces revision surgery, but at the cost of greater infection rate blood loss and operative time, and possibly an increase in early mortality even. So these patients are high risk for mortality also. Taylor, 2012, hemiarthroplasty of the hip, with or without cement. Who will tell me? Your, your, patient, decide, your patient, you decide the patient will go for hemiarthroplasty. Neck or femur fracture. You will go for cemented or non-cemented? I will go for cemented hemiarthroplasty, sir, due to okay. osteoporotic nature of the bone. Yeah, so this guy, Taylor, in 2012, concluded that both cemented and uncemented process provide comparable outcomes in terms of pain. There is significantly fewer implant complication when you use cemented hemiarthroplasty implant. There is a trend towards better function and mobility in patients treated with cemented arthroplasty. Okay? This is, I, I, I didn't show up the x ray, distal radius fracture. It's kin. 1986. Uh, actually, this was a time that uh, uh, percutaneous fixation was in a common uh, occurrence. Like he was doing, this remains a classical paper that details the uh, critical importance of reduction of good functional outcome in young patients. When the surgical technique has advanced since the time of this article, most frequent internal fixation. The observation and conclusion of this article remains valid. Before this, we were doing um, uh, conservative reductions. We will reduce the fracture, put up the cast, and then less shift So this was the beginning that he he was the one who quoted that operative intervention is better than the conservative management. So he quoted prognostic factors that influence development of post-traumatic arthritis. Failure to obtain or maintain articular incongruity, one. Two, initial disruption. Three, dorsal angulation or radial length. Fourth, maintenance of final reduction. So after this, we start doing operative intervals for distal radius fractures. This was a percutaneous fixation by Kreder et al. Uh, 2005. He quoted that uh, indirect reduction and percutaneous fixation was ORA for displaced intraarticular fractures or distal radius fractures. So at six months, he, for, he, he found better OLR function in indirect percutaneous reduction and external fixation there. However, at 12 and 24 months, there was no difference in the upper limb scores. So you can do percutaneous or you can do open. You can put an external fixator unless you have reduced the intraarticular fragment in a perfect way. This is from uh, Ikeda. Uh, if patient comes with a Mason type 3 fracture in an adult population with fracture dislocation, what you will do? You will excise the radial head or you will keep it? We'll excise the radial head and replace it with metal processes. Sir, we'll yeah. reduce the larger fragments, sir. Okay, for example, you cannot reduce. Sir, and uh, you will, you will never. Him. Okay, yeah, the, you are right, you are right. You will excise, you will put a hemia implant. If you don't have implant, you will keep the same. You will not excise it only. You get me? Right. Yeah. So he, Aikida in 2005, community fracture of radial head. His comparison of resection and internal fixation. 
resection or interview. So all missing type 3 fractures, ORF is treatment of choice when feasible. ORF group had satisfactory joint motion with greater strength and better function than patient treated with radial head excision. One major limitation of this paper was the marked difference in follow-up mm -hmm. between the two groups. Actually, an exam, they will ask you, there is a fracture, uh, five fragments of a radial head, and I'm in the OR with you, I'm your assistant, and go tell me you will excise it, you will do what with this, what approach you will use, so you will do the approach, he will explain. After that, he will ask you whether you, there is no implant with us. So you want to excise it or fix it or what you want. He said, I want to fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Not, not possible to fix. Now what you will do? So you will not. Sir, I will excise it if implant is not available. You will implant not excise. Not you will not excise. No. Okay. You don't no. excise. Okay. Because being safe practice is better than doing something which is not indicated. Okay. If a radial head fracture comes and you excise it, what can happen? There is a proximal uh, 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 Someone I heard. Essex uh, yeah. it, can, it can end up to distal unilateral joint instability as a successful rest. So we better keep it. And we'll excise it later on, no problem. But not at that time. No. This is Ring et al. 2002, open reduction and internal fixation of uh, radial head. Um, he he, he quoted that ORF is best reserved for minimally community fracture with three or fewer fragments. Okay, associated fracture dislocation of the elbow or forearm may also compromise the long term result of radial head repair, especially with regard to restoration of forearm rotation. These are the review articles. Okay, okay. Uh, this is Olekranan fracture. So, can yeah. someone tell me? My if a patient comes of two years of age and has a Olecran fracture, what are your concerns? Mm -hmm. Two years. Age of two years only. Okay. A patient of this age, two years, comes with Olecran fracture, you should exclude what? What disease you should exclude? Any idea? No idea, sir. Okay. Sorry, sir. Any olecran fracture in a pediatric oh, population? Child, child abuse. Sir. Child abuse. Yes. And then That's second. Second is osgenesis imperfecta. Oh. Try to read the book. In the book, it's written. It's it's from the book. Um, a pediatric population, if you have a olecran fracture, you should exclude in these patients of os genesis perfecta because the incidence of olecran fracture is more common in Hawaii. Uh, okay, who will tell me tension band wire in this case is better or uh, plating? So, uh, as the fracture is oblique one, so I would prefer the plate fixation in this fracture. When you will decide to do tension band wire then? Right. When there is, when there is a simple transverse fracture of the olecran. Hmm? Sir, simple fracture without intraarticular fragment. There is no combination. Simple, Attention this, is simple transverse fracture. this is simple not simple. Transverse fracture. This is not simple. This is simple, but this is oblique, sir. I can do tension band wire in this and it will be fine. No problem. It can be. Hello, be stabilized with TBW. This can be stabilized with TBW, no but yes, sir. What, yes, what, yes. what fracture you will fix with the plate, for example? Let's change it. Yes, which, fra which fracture you will put a plate? Community, uh, if, 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 no, no, one, one person, one person. Okay, Mohsen, now you start telling me. So, community. so it can be community. oblique fracture, community fracture. Okay. Another third. Third, I will tell you, extending below the coronite, the fracture which is extending below the coronite. Okay. You cannot fix it with attention. All right. So, 
in the second term. Okay, so this guy, Hume et al., 1992, he compared the clinical and radiographic comparison of tension band wiring with plate fixation. So he quoted that longer operative time is needed for plate fixation, but there is no significant difference in elbow motion between the two groups. The TBW, there is more symptomatic hardware than plate. And post up loss of reduction leading to a significant articular step off or gap, 53% in TBW and 5% in ORIF. So the author recommended that plate fixation should be strongly considered when planning ORIF for displaced olecranon fracture. In this study, plate fixation resulted in more anatomical reduction and better maintenance of reduction. The author noted the importance of placing the tension band wire deep to the tricep tendon and on the periosteum of the olecranon and bending the proximal end of the KY 180 degree and inserting them flush into the cortex of the proximal fragment. In this paper, he wrote that I'm not supporting uh, plating. He said that actually I'm just giving you the information. But in that tension band wire, he showed that it should be embedded inside the tricep. Mm -hmm. Before in 80s, they was doing tension band wire, but they were not embedding it. Okay. Are you there? In, uh, if we embed in the tricep, what is the advantage? It will not be prominent. That's the only advantage. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Child is 2008. Is tension bind wiring technique the gold standard for the treatment of electronic fracture? It's a long term functional outcome study. Uh, he quoted that male fifth decade and female sixth decade is the most common incidence of this fracture. And 61% are due to simple falls. 39% are due to high energy injuries, and supination was more affected than pronation. Author concluded that tension band wiring fixation remains the gold standard for the treatment of displaced fracture and minimally communicated, as Satish said. If there is communication, you go for plate. This is Mari Puri, he, uh, in 2007, simple elbow dislocation among adults, a comparative study between two different treatment methods. Splint for two weeks followed by physical therapy. So he said the early active mobilization is safe and cost-effective method for treatment. Early active mobilization results in significant better final outcome. So in elbow dislocation, if a patient, they give you a scenario, you will tell him that I will immobilize him just for two weeks in an arm sling. You will not tell him three, four weeks. Because this paper is now already in the book. So it is now like a known fact. Now it's not a like a, when I was in training in 2010, it found me, I was asked by my professor this and I told him four weeks and he said, no, two weeks. Yes, yes. So now it's, it's, it's a known fact that you should mobilize the patient only for two weeks and start mobilization, early active range of motion. Okay. I put him for four weeks, yeah, two weeks. Two weeks, not for four weeks. Okay, this uh, may be it sir, one question, yeah? mm -hmm. sir. Uh, when we have an oblique fracture of the olecranon, what mm -hmm. will you prefer? Either tension bed or plate fixation, sir? It depends on the fracture. I told you one thing if the fracture is extending below the coronoid, I will fix with the plate. That's it. You get me, right, sir? Check the book in, 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 in Campbell. I, I'm not sure about your textbook, Campbell, 13th edition. But if the fracture is below the coronoid, it is unstable. If it's communicated, it's unstable. So I will put it to the plate. Otherwise, most of them, I will go for a plate. Uh, sorry, tension band wiring. Right. This is ORF versus total elbow arthroplasty for displaced intraarticular distal humerus fracture in adult. And he said that total elbow arthroplasty is preferred alternative for ORF in elderly patient with complex distal humor fracture that are not amenable for stable fixation. I will, they will not ask you this, this question. Uh, who will tell me? Humerus, what are the indication for non-operative fixation? How much angulation acceptable? So 30 degrees in the coronal plane. Degrees. Okay. 30, 45 degrees. 20 degrees in the sagittal plane. Yeah, Satish is right, Mohsin. 
it is not mm. proximal humerus it is it is clinic look at the it's like a diaphyseal fracture so 30 degree in the coronal plane and 20 degree in the in EP. and how much shortening satish so uh, less than three, less than 3 centimeters very good yes very good so how, when you will operate for this satish i am asking sir, you we, yes sir we, i'll operate when there is an open fracture okay when there is when there is associated vascular injury okay when yeah. we are un unable to do the close uh, reduction of the fracture this is not indication okay then more so when these non operative parameters are not met when we have multiply injured patients just like a patient having epsilateral forearm fracture ah floating elbow okay floating Good. elbow Mm -hmm. Bilateral humerus shear fracture. fracture. If there is uh, after reduction, if there is nerve injury and uh, we have to get it open and uh, look for the any impingement or entrapment. This is not a. Uh, by the way, absolutely. This is not absolute indication. So the indication is one is open. Okay, I accept it. Second is floating elbow. Third is polytrauma. Fourth is yes. pathological. Yes. Fifth is brachial plexus injury. Yes. Not nerve injury, brachial plexus injury. Okay. So, sir, this what is about, uh, mass obesity. What? Obesity, sir, mass obesity or females with very large. These are relative indications, Abed. These are all relative indications. Obesity, large breasts, and uh, patient has bilateral, like the patient is unable, wants to be having, like, should a bilateral femur fracture or femur fracture associated lower limb fractures embolition is important but these are indications open floating polytrauma pathological beat that's it you will not say radial nerve you will not say radial nerve yes okay. so this is landmark study was sarmento so he uh, quoted that functional bracing fracture of humor shaft of humor fractures and he quoted 98% union. Shakir, Dr. Shakir. I think there is some problem. So, 98% union is achieved by functional cast brace. Okay. So, he quoted that functional bracing provides a hydraulic compressive centripetal force that maintains the fracture alignment. Okay. This landmark article provided the gold standard against which operative fixation has been judged now. Okay. This is again Sarmento 1990. He, he quoted that functional bracing of community extra articular distal third femoral fractures, 96% of the patients, the fracture will unite. Okay. He also quoted, just I will, uh, Abed, I will answer your question. The author concluded that the prefabricated brace provides satisfactory result of community extra articular distal third fracture. He also noted the high rate of nerve recovery and indicated that early expression of the nerve is not justified. This is Chapman 2000. Uh, who will tell me uh, upper limb plate is better or nail is better? Plate is better, sir. Why? Uh, Nailing causes the pain in shoulder during the movement. <laughs> Sir, the whole of humerus has not a, uh, this humerus has no medullary cavity. This is not the answer. The, the whole of the humerus has, has no medullary cavity. Sir, I will uh, uh, play, uh, 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 prefer the... Who I will prefer the... the uh, Abed, we have read right from somewhere, but the whole of the humerus has no medullary cavity. There's no the answer for whether we can do nail or not. Uh, uh, for nailing, we have to make the anti. Uh, for anti grade nailing, we have to make the anti uh, uh, around the shoulder, and okay. there are more chances of. Uh, this is the answer. Nailing. Yes. So, uh, in the upper limbs, plating is better than nailing. Okay. For us nowadays, we say that shoulder pain is more common than nailing. Yes. So here, he, this Chapman, two thousand, he said that plate is. Which, the anti-grade I am nailing associated with shoulder pain and decreased shoulder motion. Okay, for example, my patient is a polytrauma patient, bilateral femur fracture with a humerus fracture. You will do nail or a plate? We'll do nail. nail Why? Why? 
Yes. Uh, yeah, nail is less traumatic, but, but weed bearing is no problem. Either you do nail or a plate, weed bearing is not an issue. You can okay. you can give a reason in exam that I will do nail because it's less traumatic or something like this. It's okay, we'll accept it. But in my exam, when I was given a humorous scenario, I said I will nail it because I want to emulate this patient. And he accepted that at that time. But now, maybe 10 years back, I, I found out that this thing start 2000. Effect of immediate weight bearing on plated fracture of humoral shaft. He quoted that when indicated immediate weight bearing falling ORF of humerus diaphyseal fracture is safe and efficacious. So if I'm going for exam now, I will, I will tell him that I can do a plate, no problem. As per pick start 2000. Okay, uh, who will tell me what is the classification for this fracture? The near classification. Near. So, what is near has defined it as a part. You know what is part? P A R T yeah. part. Part means yes, placed. Yes, sir. Angulation, angulation more than 45 and displacement more than one centimeter. Sir, we divide into four parts the tuberosity. The uh, uh, head of humerus, the neck of humerus. Okay. The head of humerus, the shaft of humerus, and the two tuberosities, greater tuberosity and lesser tuberosity. These are four parts. Okay, good. Um, so, how will you fix it? Did, uh, you can put a Actually, there is a proper trial now, so you can do conservatively or percutaneous fixation. Already, it's a known fact. But first time done was Jabberg et al. 1992. Jabberg, what he did is percutaneous stabilization of unstable fracture of humerus. Okay, percutaneous. So this is the technique, and up till now, this is the same technique, not changed. Even in our books, Campbell, it's written the same. So his fixation technique was two pin in two pin insert into the lateral cortex just above the deltoid insertion and directed superiorly, okay? One. One pin is inserted from anterior cortex directed into the humeral head. If the grid tuberosity is displaced, it is reduced and fixed with two pins inserted from the fragment and directly inferior to engage the medial cortex. Pin should be widely spaced, means they should be distracting, sorry, divergent. Uh, grid tuberosity pins are removed at three weeks, and the remaining pins are removed after six weeks. So percutaneous pinning is technically demanding, but the results are compared within or superior to previously described ORF methods. So if you want to fix, you have to do this uh, fixation technique. This is the other review articles. If you had time, you can read it. Okay, who will tell me indication for clavicle ORF mid-shift? <coughs> Uh, so there is a one one question. Can, can, yes, sir. Uh, Eunice, you can answer me if you want to answer. Yes, sir. Here is when there is a neurovascular uh, disruption okay, or injury and mm. uh, skin impingement mm. and uh, complete uh, displacement means no contact between the parts. Uh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Good. But uh, what about a sports displacement of more than two centimeter? Yes. Yeah. Shortening of more than two centimeter or fra fracture fragments or three more than three uh, fragments. Okay. Now let's refine this answer. Why don't we call it absolute and relative indications? Hmm. Absolute is open. Skin open tapping, fracture. Skin tapping, vascular injury. Neurovascular deficit. Okay. Hmm. Relative is floating shoulder, shortening of 15 to 20 mm, and comminution. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Bilateral level. I've never seen bilateral level. If you have seen, you can put it as a relative indication. No problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so absolute are open skin tenting and neurovascular deficit. Relative is floating shoulder, shortening more than 15 20 mm and communication. You know who devised these indications? His name was McKee, 2012. He compared operative versus non-operative care of displaced mid-shaft clavicle fractures. Before this, we were 
conservatively managing. But 2012 was this landmark article now already. So before it, they were quoting that non-union trade is higher in operative group than non-operative. So do not operate on Lebanon. But here he quoted that non-union rates are significantly higher calling non-operative management than operative management. 15.5 to 1.4 percent. And symptomatic male union rates higher falling non-operative groups. Conclusion was operative treatment significantly lower rates of non-union and symptomatic male union and an earlier functional return. And by the way, let me check if I have put that article. He also quoted that clavicle non-union does not cause any other problem, but there is reduced power grip in the shoulder, strength in the shoulder. So shortening, he, he was the one who quoted that 2.5, less than 2.5 centimeter, you should measure it with both clavicles. If the shortening is more than 2.5 centimeter, then you should fix that. And the displacement, which he quoted, was more than 100%. Like there should be one clavicle in between the two uh, uh, fragments. So he could, this is the, I think, I put, 2006 deficit falling non operative to displace mid shift clavicle fracture. He said, good range of motion is achieved, no problem. The problem is that the strength of the injured shoulder was significantly reduced for all values. And he said that constant Mullis score was 71% compared to the published normative in general population, which is 92. So normal score is higher, CMS score is less than 85, I think. So it's called, it's, 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 it's known as a, a deficit. And 71 is a very low score. Who will tell me how will you debride this fracture, this location? You will reduce this fracture? Debride? Yeah. Sir, how, how will you, where this patient came to the ER, what you will do? Sir, uh, I would like to do the MESH score, sir, first. Okay, MESH score ATLS. done. ATLS. ATLS you have done, MESH have done. You will reduce Don't it. wash. Wash. What you will wash with? With uh, uh, normal saline, saline and, uh, and biodine. Okay. And you will reduce it in the ER or upstairs in the OR? Sir, in the OT, sir. In the OT. No, in the OR. Let's uh, see the, some, some of the articles over here, then I will discuss. And by the way, I'm sorry, what type of lavage you will do? The pulsatile lavage. Heavy pulsatile lavage. High, high pressure, pressure or low pressure? Sir, high pressure. Sir. Okay. High, low pressure. Abid, this was when I was going for exam, it was high pressure. After two years, yeah. I was I was in Ireland and I told somebody that is high pressure and he laughed at me. And I checked the book and it was changed. And I threw the Campbell, I think so. I, I was about to throw it outside my home. That it's, <laughs> they have changed their words. So what happens is, this is the day. In 2011, Petrisser, he gave the, uh, he wrote an article, fluid lavage of open fracture. It's a flow, uh, uh, um, study a multi-center blind factorial pilot trial comparing alternative irrigation solutions and pressures in open fractures he concluded that low pressure may decrease the reoperation rate for infection wound healing problems okay. or non-union before this high pressure lavage was written in all textbooks so okay. now it is in the book low pressure lavage not high pressure, low pressure. yes okay Pulsatile, no problem. Yes, pulsatile, no pressure lavage. Sir, sir, uh, so we will go for a low pressure pulsatile lavage. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Regarding povidone or normal saline or hydrogen peroxide, see this. Uh, this was Anglin 2005. Comparison of soap and antibiotic solution for irrigation of lower limb open fractures. A prospective randomized study. He quoted. Irrigation of open fractures wound with antibiotic solution may increase the risk of wound healing problems. And the conclusion was irrigation of open fracture wound with antibiotic solution offer no advantage over the use of non-sterile soap solutions. So, povidone, hydrogen peroxides, 
these are of no benefits. By the way, in many countries, hydrogen peroxide, for example, if you're doing total hip replacement and you're washing the femoral canal, most of the countries, it is abandoned to wash it with hydrogen peroxide. Do you know this? It is abandoned in many countries. So if you are going, for example, you are going from here to France and you're operating, doing total hip, I hope, inshallah, some of you are good enough to do total hip replacement in France, going there as a visiting consultant, they will not allow you to do use hydrogen peroxide to wash the female canal. Because the end artery, they act as end artery and it will decrease, it will, it will burn the tissue over there. Okay? Right. So there is a saying, this is by, I think it was by Einstein. If we knew what we were doing, it would not be called a research, would it? So like what, whatever we are doing, maybe after a year or two or 10 years, it will all be refuted. Okay. So that's it. <coughs> So I hope you learn. Well I done, well done, you. well you. done, well 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 I hope that uh, many people will join it. It's only 10, 12 people were there out of 200, out of 200. So hope that these 12 people will tell others that they should join. Mm -hmm. well, these well, done, well, well, these well, 12 people are more intelligent people, respectable people. So they are joining. So we are here for them. No problem. Thank you. Inshallah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.